let's go ahead and get started. Uh, going over the agenda, uh, we'll do some introductions of ourselves uh, and we'll talk about uh, how to launch an effective email campaign, uh, how to host a successful virtual meeting, and lastly, talk about mass uh, texting uh, and how to get involved and we'll share some vendors about that. So uh, I'd like to start off the introduction. Um, many of you might already know me. My name is JL. I'm the operations manager at the uh, Harris County Democratic Party. So uh, along with, you know, doing the day-to-day -day operations, uh, I also help out with digital, um, with like Instagram, uh, the Blue Report, um, a couple of posts on Facebook. So that's kind of the hand I have in like digital. Um, and I want to pass it over to RJ. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is RJ, the Northwest organizer with the party. Um, I've been helping with uh, this presentation and I'll be going over the mass uh, texting portion of this uh, presentation. Uh, hi guys, my name is Ariel. I'm the Southwest and Asian American Pacific Islander field organizer. I've been helping with the graphics, uh, the digital presentations and um, Instagram content and whenever is needed for the digital uh, team as needed. Awesome, thanks guys for the introduction. So real quick, we do want to recap. Uh, we did have a first session in these digital organizing uh, series. If you would like to view the first one, which went over digital content uh, and the three components of it, you can visit uh, that first, that first uh, video on harrisdemocrats.org slash trainings, as well as all the other trainings that we have held uh, during this time. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about launching an effective campaign. Okay, so why choose email? Um, like, is it still relevant? Next slide, please. So according to the Harvard Business Review, uh, professionals check their emails 15 times per day, which is pretty substantial. So while not everyone uses email, I think enough people use it where it's still very effective. So we're just gonna go over the parts that um, you need to take into consideration for email campaigns. Uh, such as growing, cement, growing and segmenting your email list, uh, choosing the right email service for you. Uh, we're going to go over some tips to help improve the rates that people open your emails. And uh, just some basic tips on writing engaging content. So building lists. So lists, um, you can basically build it through um, people who attend your events, whether it's virtual or in person. Uh, people in your, the, the list can incorporate people in your club, people you've met and have worked with in your precinct and district, etc. cetera. Uh, typically, um, and a lot of you have been to physical or like in real life events before COVID. Um, so for, for the sign-up sheets, it'd be like, uh, you put in your name, number, email, um, and then just whether or not you want to join your email list. And that, that's a, a big way to grow your, um, your list but i think what's more important is organizing your list so you can send targeted emails so doing this makes it easier um, and what it makes it it just makes sense to send targeted emails so it's more relevant for the people you're sending it to but more importantly it makes it so your emails are more likely to be opened so for example um take this graphic of all these high school teens, right? So they're all high school teens, but they all have different um, interests. So like for the Democratic Party, like um, I have a, a list that's all Democrats, but there's the Asian American advocate Democrats, the reporters, the precinct chairs, the club and orgs leaders. Um, I use like, I have all these different lists. So I have targeted emails for all those different people. And these are just the most, like some of the most common email services. There are a bunch out there, but these are the ones that I see most um, used. I think everyone probably knows about Gmail already. It's free, widely used. You can uh, use templates to spruce them up. You can schedule out your emails and it's good for smaller lists. Uh, the way I organize lists through Gmail is just using Google spreadsheets. It's, it's, and then whenever you send it, you just um, copy and paste all the emails and send it. But if you're using Gmail or another service like Gmail, just remember to use VCC. Um, you don't want to um, 
blast everyone's information out there and you also don't want to spam everyone in case someone responds. Another option is MailChimp. So MailChimp I personally use for the Asian American list. There's uh, free, there's um, free services and paid services up to like uh, if you have a big business you can use MailChimp. But even the free services, um, the basic package is very good for just, it's good for what I need. So there's basic templates, there's surveys, um, and you can even see how well your emails are doing, which is how often your emails are being opened. And then there's um, NGP Van. So NGP Van is more for like the party or for campaigns. It's paid. It's good for mass emails. Um, for example, we use it for our Blue Report. We, if, for, um, by the way, if you're not signed up for the Blue Report, please sign up for the Blue Report if you want to keep updated with us. It's good for fundraising campaigns. Um, email fundraising is one of the best ways to fundraise. But again, it's recommended for bigger campaigns and organizations. I wouldn't necessarily use it if you are a precinct chair. I don't use it to send out emails. It's a little more cumbersome. Um, but that's just an option out there. So these are just some do's and don'ts to increase on uh, the rates of how many times you're, sorry, to improve the open rates for emails. So do make sure the people in your list have opted in. Again, like you can send a bunch of people emails, but if they didn't agree to it, they could always just unsubscribe. You want to make sure that people actually want to receive your emails and you can do that via sign-in sheets or just like asking. Do you clean out your email list? Uh, sometimes when people fill out their emails on a sign-up sheet, um, their handwriting is not so good, so you send out the right email. You just want to clean out all the emails that bounce back. You want to use friendly and personable language. You want to make sure your subject line stands out. You want to use a simple format. And what, about, what I mean by that is you don't want to use like three columns for an email, it's just not good for mobile. And on that note, you want to use a larger font and use a large call to action button for, and that is because uh, it's just easier for mobile users to read and navigate. So don't, please don't use excessive salesy language. Um, this isn't really um, so important for our work, like get out the vote work, but if you use salesy language like, oh, good deals, good discounts, it might get marked as spam and people will dismiss your emails. You don't want to write an email as if you're talking to a group of people. This is a mistake I used to make a lot um, because yes, while you are sending a mass email, acting as if like you're not talking to the individual, it's just going to turn people off. So that's a lesson I had to learn. That's important to know. Don't use large Im images that are difficult to load. Um, I've seen some emails where an image someone sends takes up the entire screen. One that's just not good for loading times for desktops, but also is definitely not good for mobile phones. And just to note, a lot of people do check their emails using their phones rather than desktop. Uh, you do not want to have links right next to each other. Just, this just makes it uh, hard for mobile users and also uh, you don't want to create an image that would, sorry, an email that would look out, excuse me, you do not want to create an email that would look bad without its images. So while graphics are really good to um, make your email look better, if your email doesn't make sense without a graphic, don't use it. And that's because some mobile phones just don't look like they uh, don't load photos automatically. That's their default. And something that's really important for email or just social media in general is timing really matters. So the best days to send an email are Tuesday, Thursday, and Wednesday. And the best times to tep uh, typically send an email are around like 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 8 p.m. Those are the optimal times. Uh, we're going to send this, um, this presentation out later so you can like uh, see all this information later. But that's just something to, important to keep to know. So this is our checklist. Um, again, we're going to send this out. It's just something before you send an email out, especially if it's to like a, a hundred people or a large group of people, you want to make sure everything looks good. You want to make sure all your links are right. I've made the mistake before when I would uh, 
send phone bank emails of linking the wrong phone bank sometimes. So you just want to double check everything before you send it. And again, we're going to um, send this presentation to you for your consideration later. And here's just as an example of an email. So one, the, the subject line clearly stands out. It's friendly. The, the font is large and easy to read. It's bolded where it's important. The language is pretty friendly. And the, the call to action button is large and in charge. So it's an easy to press. And um, again, this email makes sense without an image. So even if I like spend a lot of time working on a graphic, it's, it's more important for the email to make sense. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ariel, for uh, the, you know, going over how to launch an effective email campaign. So uh, now let's talk about uh, hosting a successful virtual meeting. So, um, you know, with any event, you're going to have to go through different guides uh, in order to make sure that your event is successful. So with virtual events, you're going to want to take into consideration these five uh, main points. Uh, choosing the right tools, uh, going over a checklist and do's and don'ts before the meeting, uh, more do's and don'ts during the meeting, um, and then things that you should be take, uh, can, taking into consideration uh, post-meeting. And we'll go over these uh, in the next few slides. So choosing the right tools. Uh, you know, whenever you're choosing um, a remote, remote meeting tool, you're going to have to ask yourself these three things. What are your needs? Uh, do you, you know, do you need to be able to see your participants' uh, video? Uh, will they be needing to uh, have the capability to raise their hands, throw in questions, uh, things like that? Um, you know, how many people are you hosting? If you are only hosting a group of people anywhere from like 5 to 20, you know, you're obviously going to want to look at more of the free softwares. Uh, but if you're going to want to reach out to say like 200 max, then you're obviously going to have to put a little bit more money into uh, the tools that you're going to uh, purchase for these purposes. Uh, and lastly, you know, what's your budget? So again, you know, taking into consideration that second part, um, if you do have a lot of money to uh, spend on these, go ahead and, uh, you know, look at all the different um, uh, uh, capabilities that come with these meetings. Um, and so, Let's talk about the different tools. We're going to look at some free softwares first. So, of course, there's YouTube, where you're able to, uh, you know, go uh, live on YouTube. You will have to have an account for it. Uh, there is no limit. Uh, you can have an unlimited number of participants on there. Uh, for uh, there's also Google Hangouts, uh, which they have uh, just done an update uh, due to the, you know, COVID-19 situation, uh, which makes it a little bit more accessible to uh, Google users. So it is free, there is no limit on your meeting. Uh, you can hold up to 100 participants on there, uh, unlimited number of meetings, uh, and you have the capability of screen sharing. Now, I do wanna um, make, make it, um, a note that there are a lot of softwares, or you know, there's so many out there, but we, uh, we only uh, focused on uh, seven or so, and we will send this presentation so you can view the different options um, you know, and how to get started on this. Uh, there's also Facebook Live, which is free again. Uh, there's no limit. Uh, an unlimited number of participants and an unlimited number of meetings for this. Um, there's also free conference call, which has both video and uh, audio capabilities. Uh, it is free, there is no limit, you have up to 100 participants, and you can screen share and record. Now, um, you know, with recording, you do have, again, that capability to uh, share it with people who weren't able to attend, or, you know, uh, share it out to uh, or promote it to people who you know didn't get that uh, initial invite the first time. So now let's look at some paid software. So there, uh, the most famous and popular one is a uh, Zoom. Uh, I'm sure you've seen all those uh, Zoom screenshots. Uh, we're currently using Zoom Webinar, which is uh, a little bit more pricey, uh, but they they do have a basic plan, which is free. Um, you can hold up to 100 participants, and you know you have an un unlimited number of meetings. Uh, and screen sharing capabilities. Uh, now, the only con for that is that you do have a 40-minute limit uh, on uh, on the free uh, the free Zoom plan. Um, so, you know, you're going to want to take that into consideration. Um, but again, if you have like really short meetings, that would be perfect for you. Uh, there's also a join.me. Uh, we're going to be looking specifically at the pro version. It is $19.99 uh, per user per month. Uh, one thing to uh, consider whenever looking at these different uh, softwares is that 
it usually has the price uh, per user per month. So uh, we, we got really excited when uh, you know, we saw a really reasonable price and we're like, yeah, that's affordable per month. But then it's like per user. So if you want to have you know, multiple hosts with all the same capabilities, um, you know, it, the price is going to go up. But um, one thing that you could do is if you just have uh, that one user account and then just share the passcode with the, the, the team or whoever's going to be using uh, these virtual meetings, that can save you money. So you don't have to buy it for you know every single uh, user, and I would like you know be very costly. Um, and so, uh, like I said, we'll share this information so you are able to see all these different um, pros and cons for these meetings. So before your meeting begins, right, you're going to want to uh, take into consideration these items. You're going to want to test your tech, confirm your uh, speakers, and choose a topic. Schedule a date. Send out that invitation and uh, schedule a dry run with your speakers or anybody who's participating in your virtual meetings. So uh, test, test, and test it again, right? Uh, with, with anything, especially with technology, uh, things are bound to go wrong sometimes. So, you know, nothing kills the momentum um, at the beginning of a meeting um, like, a, like a long wait time. So, you know, whether it's like downloading the software, making sure that your uh, participants and panelists have tested the video and the audio, um, making sure that you're able to screen share. I know it sounds super simple, uh, but when you actually, you know, get on the back end uh, and, and you're like uh, presenting to a crowd of like 200, um, you know, an accidental thing might happen and you might show a screen that you're not wanting, you know, you weren't intending to show. So definitely practice uh, and test your screen sharing capabilities um, uh, and as well as your Wi-Fi. Uh, so again, you know, with technology, everything, you know, is a, uh, is a, uh, things are bound to happen, right? So you're gonna to wanna to test your, uh, the Wi-Fi of the location that you're at um, and make sure that if, you know, if it's not spotty or laggy. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to do this you know, as soon as you sign up for that, for that tool, uh, test it out, play with it, see what features you have. Uh, and then test it out a week uh, or two um, before the event and you know, do, do an, an, uh, another one a day or two uh, before the event just to make sure that you haven't missed anything and you know, just to avoid anything going wrong during the meetings. Um, the next thing you're gonna wanna do you know, is confirm, uh, confirm your speakers, you know, choose a topic and confirm your speakers. So uh, some things to consider are you know, what's your objective? Um, if you're in a campaign and you um, want to, uh, you, know, you know that your election is like you know, two months away, uh, your main objective might be to highlight your candidate. So, you know, take things uh, like that into consideration. Uh, you know, who's your audience? If you are targeting uh, young students to let them know the importance of getting engaged, um, you know, um, take that into consideration. Uh, always look at holidays. So uh, we actually have tomorrow um, a, a Ramadan virtual event happening at 3 p.m. Uh, we can share the link for that as well, uh, but you know, build events or build your meetings around holidays uh, to commemorate them and to highlight uh, the people who are doing the work on the ground. Um, and then uh, also a good thing to do is, you know, have multiple days for your speakers to choose. If you have a high level speaker who uh, you already know has a very busy schedule, you know, give them different dates so they can choose. Uh, but of course, you know, with, uh, with the situation and, and some of us going back to work, we all have different schedules. So it just benefits everybody to have different, uh, different dates to choose from. Um, the next thing you're going to want to do is, you know, uh, find the best date. So uh, it's always best to try to schedule it uh, as far in advance as you can, because that gives you more time to promote, thus giving you a bigger audience. Uh, some things to consider, you know, again, who is going to be your audience? Uh, if you are, again, trying to target uh, young folks who are, you know, uh, trying to express the importance of getting involved, um, make it on like an evening when you know they don't have like class uh, or maybe on a weekend, um, you know, think uh, or take into consideration, is it time sensitive? Um, if you, um, if the county judge has just issued a specific uh, order um, and you wanted to do just a meeting to your club members or to your, you know, your volunteers and, and friends, uh, you're gonna wanna do that a lot sooner than you would say a town hall for, um, for a candidate that has an election like five months out, right? Um, consider your speaker's schedule. So 
uh, you know, going back to just giving them multiple uh, dates and times to consider. Um, if you know, again, if they're like a very high level elected official, um, you know, see if, uh, if they're like in, um, in session during, during the morning. And then so instead make, make the event uh, towards the afternoon or the evening. Also consider holidays um, because, you, you know, one, one of the worst things that you want, uh, you want to avoid is having a meeting uh, during a big holiday and your meeting has nothing to do with the holiday, right? Um, it, it, it's a little bit, you know, sometimes disrespectful, um, but also, you know, you don't want to take away um, uh, audience members from, from that holiday uh, to come to your meeting that has nothing to do with it, right? Uh, next thing is you want to send out that meeting invitation. So uh, publish it, right? Uh, you want to first create your sign-up tool. So whether it's Mobilize America, uh, a Google form or sign up genius. And again, there are, you know, there's many different uh, sign up platforms, but just choose one that works for you. And we can send out some, uh, some different uh, options after, after this meeting and the follow up. Um, you know, and once you have that sign up ready to go, publish it on all forms of social media that you can Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, if you have a YouTube channel, go ahead and, you know, post a save the date video on there. Uh, send it out in an email blast to your, uh, to your group, uh, send it out in a text message and, uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. Um, and last but not least, before your meeting, um, you know, comes, you're going to want to practice one last time. Um, get your speakers, get your troubleshooters, get your tech people, anybody and everybody who is going to be participating on the back end of your meeting, um, schedule a date to do a dry run. Uh, you know, with all events in person and virtual, it's always best to practice uh, over practice, right? Just to make sure that nothing happens uh, that'll, that'll, you know, slow down your meeting or anything like that. Uh, so you again, you know, just test the audio and the video, uh, test uh, the, the run of show, go through the whole run of show, uh, go over talking points. And uh, one important thing is uh, to have a backup. So um, if, again, with Wi-Fi, right, if something goes down, um, and the main speaker's Wi-Fi or the person who's presenting, if their Wi-Fi goes down, you're going to want to set up somebody who is a backup, um, who can quickly log in, uh, in into that, um, into that uh, virtual meeting and pull up the presentation if you were screen sharing um, to avoid any like lag or any confusion during the meeting. Um, all right. And then, uh, you know, perfect. You've uh, sent out the invitation and now it's the day of the meeting. Um, so during the meeting, you're going to want to assign a facilitator. Uh, if you're going to have more than, you know, two to three panelists or speakers, uh, you know, going uh, speaking during this presentation, um, it's best to assign a facilitator to, uh, to be able to transition from speaker to speaker, uh, who can facilitate questions um, and anything else that falls in between. Uh, you're going to want to set clear objectives. Uh, whether it's laying out the agenda, laying out the goals of the meeting, make sure that your participants know what you're going to be talking about um, so they don't have this idea in their head and then, you know, 40 minutes in, they're like, wait, I didn't even learn anything that I wanted to, right? So make sure you make those very clear at the beginning. Um, include some icebreakers. So um, it's definitely a little harder to, you know, do icebreakers um, in, in a virtual sense because, you know, people are talking over each other uh, instead of like an in-person event. Uh, but throw in some questions, do some polls, like before the meeting, if you want to send out, uh, send out an email with some quirky questions like, you know, uh, what's your favorite type of cake or, you know, uh, what brought you into, uh, into politics? You know, what moved you to get engaged? Um, and then just kind of reading out some of those icebreakers at the beginning of the meeting is a great idea, um, you know, to get everybody comfortable with each other uh, and, you know, kick off the, a, a really great meeting. Um, consider the duration. So if you set your meeting from 1 to 1.30, right, um, it's okay if like, it goes over maybe a few minutes for questions and answers. Um, but if you go over like an additional 30 minutes or an hour, that is like totally unacceptable, right? Um, because you gotta, you gotta respect people's time, um, uh, and just make sure that, you know, you're not going over the time limit that you uh, initially set. Uh, and lastly, you know, make it visual and make it engaging. Um, because, you know, with any meeting in person and virtual, it's sometimes a little hard to keep up, um, because, you know, your phone beings or, you know, you think about what you're going to eat for dinner. Um, so, you know, definitely, uh, make it, uh, make it engaging, put in some videos. Um, and, uh, 
try to try to make it as appealing as possible. Uh, and to elaborate a little bit more on making it visual uh, and engaging, um, you know, just like in an in-person meeting, you're going to want to engage with your audience. So uh, for Zoom, for example, you're going to want to utilize that hand, uh, raise hand feature. So if, uh, for example, if we want to ask, like, you know, uh, how many of y'all are excited about, you know, getting Trump out of office in November? And you see all those hands raised on your, on your uh, Zoom meeting, you're going to want to take, like, a, you know, a screenshot of that. Um, just because, again, you are, you always want to engage with your audience. Uh, include polls, um, whether it's you're trying to get a feel of who, do you, who your audience is uh, or just trying to get some feedback from them during the meeting. Um, this is a great way to continue to engage with them. And of course, questions and answers, uh, uh, whether you do questions and answers after each segment or questions and answers at the very end of your presentation, you know, whatever works best for you, we usually do it at the very end of the meeting. Um, and, and with that, you know, we do also have a, quest, a Q and A section uh, that you can throw in some questions there and then we'll get to it at the end uh, and answer any questions that you have. So uh, let's look at some do's and don'ts. And again, we'll share this presentation. Um, so you can read and take your time with this. Uh, you know, do be courteous to others who are participating in the meeting with you. Uh, do speak, speak clearly. It's sometimes a little hard, uh, you know, because you're wanting to talk fast or you're just nervous, right? But always remember to try to speak clearly. Uh, do keep uh, body movements minimal. Uh, it's something that, you know, is challenging here, there, um, more so to others. Um, you know, do maintain eye contact. Uh, by looking at the camera. So, you know, you don't want to be looking afar, looking over the camera or looking down, right? Um, do you dress appropriately? Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen uh, that video of the cameraman who uh, didn't have pants on. Uh, he only had a shirt and they, when they zoomed out, they caught him without pants. So make sure you're wearing, you know, appropriate clothing. Um, do make the session animated. Again, you know, you're going to want to keep people engaged um, throughout the presentation. Um, and then, you know, Ultimately, be yourself and have fun um, because that, that'll show off in the presentation. Um, some don'ts are, you know, don't make distracting sounds or movements. I'm sure if I started wailing my arms, it'd be like, you know, what is happening? Uh, you know, don't shout. Uh, don't interrupt other speakers. You know, it, just to be courteous. Yeah. Um, don't carry on side conversations. I know sometimes it's a little hard uh, getting used to doing like virtual meetings, like maybe your child or, you know, your family member approaches you, put, put your uh, mic on mute and then you can have that conversation, right? Um, and uh, don't wear noisy jewelry. Um, so sometimes with different audio, uh, some sounds pick up, uh, um, pick up um, a lot more than others. So if you have some dangly earrings that you know are a little bit noisy, maybe don't wear them for, uh, for that specific meeting. Um, and don't cover the microphone. So especially, I think it's easier to do that on a phone uh, if you're speaking into it, right? But on the, on the laptop too, you know, try not to cover your phone, uh, your microphone, sorry. Uh, and most importantly, don't forget the photo. So uh, this is a photo that we took from our central phone bank uh, yesterday. So, you know, it's, it's a great way just to advertise or um, your meeting or just putting it in a follow-up uh, follow email or text to all of your participants uh, so they can, you know, cherish it forever and ever and ever. Uh, and post-meeting, you, um, again, are going to want to do a follow-up email or text. It's typically best to do one or two days right after. Uh, we usually send out our follow-ups the day after. Uh, we include, you know, make sure to include resources, uh, anything that was promised during the meeting, um, donation links, if, if, if that's appropriate uh, during that time, um, and then some call to action links. So, uh, you know, at the Harris County Democratic Party, we are hyper focused, again, on getting Trump out of office, but most importantly, on getting vote by mail applications to those who are eligible. So, uh, whenever we get a chance, we throw in some phone banking links in there uh, because, again, that is our, you know, that is our goal. That's what we're doing every single day. Uh, and talking to voters, um, you know, again, every single day to make sure that they know they can vote by mail um, if eligible. Um, and if you have any speakers or, or, you know, elected officials to join you, you know, send them a thank you, whether it's a, a handwritten letter, a text message, or an email, you know, definitely let them know that you appreciate uh, their time, um, you know, and, and just to create uh, 
sorry, create that relationship. So if you need, um, if you need to have them come on for a second meeting later on, um, you know, they will uh, be more, um, more willing to do so. Great, perfect. So now let's uh, move it, uh, move not over to RJ, sorry, for mass texting. All right, thank you, JL. Yeah, we'll go over how and uh, why we use mass texting services, uh, if people see our messaging, and what the contact rate is like. So why texting? Well, texting gives us the ability to send messages quickly to many people. It does have a high read rate. Around 80% of the texts that we send will be read. Uh, it also has a good contact rate with around 20% of those messages actually getting a reply. Um, how we use it on a campaign, well, we use it for quite a few different things. Um, it's good for event recruitment. So I would suggest using it as a complement over uh, with other event recruitment efforts like a mobilized link and phone banking. Um, you know, sometimes when you're making phone calls, you may uh, get a voicemail or you, you just want to make sure that that person actually receives that message for that event. Uh, so it's always good to send something additional like a text uh, or even an email. Um, you know, it's good to follow up with people to confirm if they've uh, signed up using the mobilized link and things like that. Uh, it's also good for identifying supporters and persuasion. Uh, you know, we ask our supporters to pledge to vote and uh, people that you want to persuade to consider supporting your candidate. It's also good with issues, just asking people which issues matter to them the most and getting the response from that text. Um, can also be used, again, as a complement with fundraising efforts. Um, so it's good for uh, quite a few things. Uh, when have we used it? So, yeah, uh, we use it primarily to get out the vote. In 2018, we were able to send 650,000 texts. And also with uh, this past primary this year, we were able to send 200,000 texts. Uh, it's very effective at providing the location for people's polling places. Uh, especially with young people that are constantly checking their phone and they read their texts. Um, we're able to ask people how they'll get to their polling place. Are they going to drive? Are they going to walk? You know, if they're going to take public transit, do they need a ride? Um, also asking people what time they are voting and uh, making sure that they have a plan to vote. So we've used uh, quite a few different programs. Um, I know we've used Hustle before, especially in 2018. This past primary, we used ThruText. The good thing about all of these programs is that they're all VAN integrated, meaning that you can cut a list from VAN and use that list with any of these programs to text that list that you cut. The pricing does vary across these uh, different uh, programs or platforms. Most of them do have a pay-as-you-go service. So if you want to send a certain amount of text, you only have to pay for what you send. It's really good just to do your research depending on what you want to use that for. If you're texting the same amount of people, let's say you're a club leader and you won't have a whole bunch of members that you want to text, you may want to look into something like Hustle where plans are based on the number of contacts that are uploaded and you can text that phone number unlimited times for a set price as opposed to um, you know, another program where you have to pay every single time um, per, per that message. Um, most of these programs do offer um, unlimited messaging plans. Some have static numbers, meaning that you can use that same number over and over again to text your group of people. Others, like through text, may not have that static number. Um, every time you send a text, it'll be from a different number. So again, it's just really good to do your research. Um, kind of look more into these programs. Always get a quote. Most of these programs have free trials. So it's good to just go in and test them, get a feel for what you like best or what's good for your group. And then, um, you know, go ahead and subscribe or pay as you go. Um, also wanna just share some best practices. So you always wanna follow the script of your text, but respond accordingly. A good story that I have from this past primary is uh, we have automatic messages sent and it'll be something like, do you have a plan to vote? Do you know where to go vote? And somebody responded with, um, you know, yes, I, I will go vote early voting, but what is my polling place? And so I use that opportunity to edit the automatic response and, you know, tell them right now you can vote anywhere in Harris County. The law changed, but here are the three closest locations to you that you can go vote. And, um, 
you know, again, you, that's just a good example of when to respond accordingly. You um, are sending automatic responses, but you don't always want to sound like a robot. You know, people want to be talking to somebody on the other end. Um, at the same time, it's always good to ignore bad responses that you get because you will get a lot of bad responses, especially if you're texting people that aren't part of your group. Um, and you don't want to waste money responding to somebody who's just trolling. Um, so respond promptly. While it is e easy to send out hundreds of texts over a few minutes, it's important just to reply and mark the information as people reply. Keep your text short and sweet, under 180 characters to avoid any message breakups. Again, you don't want to be paying more than you have to. And you also don't want to put any links in the initial text. Um, sometimes those texts will get marked as spam and you want to make sure that that text is being received and also just end with a call to action. You want to make sure that people, you give people something to respond to. And yeah, so thank you all so much for joining us. Please drop any questions below in the Q&A and any that are already there, we're more than happy to respond to. Thank you, RJ. Uh, so we do have a question. Uh, the first one's how accessible is Mobilize America and the other sign of tools to smaller clubs? So for uh, smaller clubs, uh, the Harris County Democratic Party uh, does coordinate with them for Mobilize America. Uh, but let's see, it seems to be an anonymous attendee. Um, so I'm not too sure which club it is. Um, if you're still online, um, you mind just telling us which club it is and we'd be more than happy to, you know, connect with you. Um, and the uh, official clubs, the official Harris County Democratic Party clubs, do you get one Mobilize America uh, user login? Um, so again, you know, if um, it's anonymous, but if you would like to tell me, oh, yes, is, is it John, I believe. Um, we will connect with you right after uh, to try to get you some information on how to get that Mobilize America uh, user login. Uh, let's see, next question. What's the most frequent issue you've had while using a video conference service to hold meetings? So I would like to say the biggest issue has been just connection on my end. Um, you know, there's definitely uh, testing it like the day before, uh, especially in like in my apartment. Um, if I'm like really far from the modem, um, it, it definitely gets a lot laggier for this situation or for this uh, webinar. I had to come to uh, our headquarters uh, just to ensure that we had a great quality network uh, and it wouldn't drop off or anything. Um, a couple of other issues that have been brought up are um, having, you know, extra security. Um, I know you probably have read articles about like Zoom bombers, um, you know, coming into a meeting and just like spamming. Um, we have not had any, any of those problems occur, uh, but some best practices are, you know, to put uh, a meeting password on your, um, on your meetings. Uh, make it registration only, so that way when people are signing up for your meetings, you can vet them. Uh, there's actually an option um, that um, you can only send uh, email I'm sorry, you can only send the, the actual meeting link to folks uh, who you have vetted one by one. Um, so, you know, just uh, looking into those best practices um, to make sure that your meeting is secure uh, to avoid any, any uh, you know, any of those spammings happening. Uh, but like I said, we haven't had anything like that happen um, on our end. Um, and then, you know, just uh, trying to get the best timing for folks. Uh, it's a little bit of a weird transition right now. Um, where a couple of weeks ago, uh, people were at home, uh, you know, every day. Uh, but now with the uh, businesses opening up, we are again in a bit of a transition where some folks are working uh, and some folks are still at home. So just trying to find the best time and date um, with your uh, meetings is, is something to also consider uh, whenever hosting in the future. Um, another question. Uh, from John, if I want to set up a club meeting on my Zoom account, but would like to register, oh yeah, if you want to register, register them through Mobilize. So the Texas Democratic Party actually has a one pager on best practices with integrating, or with, uh, sorry, using Zoom and Mobilize America. So we will include that in the follow-up email. Um, and it just kind of gives like some best practices on how to do that. So uh, what we normally do um, is, um, you know, set up that Mobilize America link and uh, there's a section called like private details that only sends it to folks who have signed up for your uh, for your event. So we usually include the, the sign up uh, link, sorry, the link to the actual meeting in the private details. So that way folks who sign up 
get it in an email confirmation and then they have the capability to add it to their calendar and you know they have that link ready to go uh, you know to click on on the day of the meeting all right um, let's see um, another question is other than mobilize America are there tools that HCDP provides to clubs so they don't have to obtain it on their own um, let's see so at the moment um, at the moment we do have just like the tools that, that we uh, displayed on this um, on this webinar, uh, but we can send out a couple more uh, you know more information on that. Um, I believe. Do, do you mean like? Do you mean like so you don't have to create your own account? Um, we'll get back to you on that, um, Alan. Uh, thank you for your question, um, but we can get back to you on that on seeing if we can you know share our uh, our platforms to uh, to clubs so you don't have to go out and you know get your own. Um, but, but definitely we'll be able to share all the software uh, tools that we displayed on this webinar um, and how to like, you know, view the pricing and how to sign up for those. Um, but I'll definitely get back on the uh, portion of whether uh, you'll be able to use like the HCDP's, uh, HCDP's tools. All right, so, um, cool. Um, then, uh, if anybody has any more questions, you know, again, feel free to uh, put them in that. Q&A section awesome let's see we have another question how do you uh, do a zoom screenshot uh, awesome yes so uh, it, it differs uh, between computer right so on my computer there is a button that says uh, print screen uh, so I typically just click on that button that says print screen uh, you know and open up either uh, paint or um, I think paint usually works best so just open up a, you know, a paint window and it's usually like paint 3D or you know, whatever software just comes with your laptop and um, paste it on there and you can just save it as an image. Um, but um, Ariel and RJ, do y'all have any different ways how y'all uh, screenshot your Zooms? Or is that yeah. basically the same? Yeah, I have, I have a Mac. Um, if you do Command Shift 3, it takes a picture of your whole screen. Uh, if you do command shift four then you can like uh drag and like crop a specific image so that's one way that i've taken pictures or zoom um if anybody else has anything else that they've used on a mac you know feel free to share it yeah thank sorry you. i forgot i was muted yeah all we have all you have to do is print screen and uh copy and paste you want to um i can like screen share real quick if that you want to do that or no yeah, yeah for sure so I'm gonna like print screen right now. It's just a button again. It's just a button on the um my my computer. Okay. Oh, I can I don't think I can uh, screen share jail. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Oops, so that's, a, sorry, that's another one. So all I did was uh, copy and paste from the print screen. Wait, can you see my screen, Jill? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then all you have to do is crop it the way you want it to crop like that, and then just save the image. So it'll be like screen share, or no, like zoom screenshot. And that's all, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Thank you, Ariel. And yeah, and we can we can send a, a, a little bit of a um, you know step by step uh, write up and the follow up email too, uh, specifically for screenshots. So I know it's a little bit challenging sometimes when it comes to uh, you know different uh, Macs or you know Microsoft. So, uh, but thank you so much, guys, for answering those. Mm, let's see, we do have a couple. Okay, so. Um, there seems to be uh, no other questions, uh, but again, if anybody does have any, feel free to uh, you know throw them in that quest, uh, Q and A section. Um, and like I said, you know we're, we are recording this webinar, uh, and we'll share the recording and also the uh, slide presentation um, to view later or share it with anybody who hasn't uh, you know who didn't get a chance to view this. All right, so. Um, 
All right, awesome. So it doesn't seem that we have any more questions at this moment. Um, but like I said, we will send a follow up uh, with our emails on there. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out uh, directly to us or just, you know, um, to, to the Harris County Democratic Party and we will get back to you with any questions that you do have. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today for the, uh, you know, second series of the uh, digital organizing. Um, and I hope you ha guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, y'all.